And welcome back everyone, it's Keith once again, and today we are talking exclusively about Intel's Gen 11 graphics, which we discussed pretty in depth at the Intel Blueprint event that I attended a few weeks back now, maybe a couple weeks, uh, time escapes me, but this is something that they're talking about over at Computex right now, and we're definitely going to cover a little bit on this video just about Gen 11. If you want to know more about Ice Lake or Project Athena, check over on the site. We'll link those down in the description below where we went in depth about those two different type of things from Intel, one being their 10 nanometer Ice Lake CPU and the other one being their super low power laptops. But let's jump into it with Gen 11 graphics. So gaming later, but let's look at the details first. So the idea here is definitely seeing improvements over the HD 620 graphics, which isn't really that hard to do in all honesty. So one of the things that you're looking at here is two fixed function HEVC encoders, which are allowing up to a 4K 60 FPS stream at 444 or an 8K 30 stream at 420. Or it could also run two 4K 30s at 420, as was stated at the event when they were questioned further. But moving into the specifications of the iGPU itself, we're looking at 64 EU or execution units up to 1.1 gigahertz core clock, which translates to roughly 1.12 teraflops of FP32 full precision compute performance, but also pumps out up to 2.25 teraflops in FP16 half precision workloads, which is fairly good for Intel integrated graphics and should come in handy for things like uh, quick sync over in Adobe Premiere and things like that. They've also enhanced the rasterizer to 16 pixels per clock and are featuring 3 megabytes of L3 cache along with a half megabyte of shared local memory. Now there is no ED RAM on these like they had back with the Broadwell chips whenever they came out with the, the i5 and i7 XX series and it doesn't appear to affect it much. And I almost forgot that they are featuring variable rate shading. So this is a very similar and it's actually pretty much the exact same tech that you see on the Turing GPUs where it can render different portions of the scene at different resolutions, allowing for uh, the targeted scene area to be a higher resolution than less important areas of the screen, resulting in higher performance, which we did get to see that in action, and it was pretty impressive. But we'll have to wait until we see it in more games to see how useful it really is. Now they will be targeting smooth gaming, as they said, with up to 1.8x faster gaming performance than the previous integrated UHD 620 graphics, and they will be supporting Adaptive Sync, which we'll show you here shortly in action, as we were seeing some people play Counter-Strike Global Offensive over at the event with the uh, Adaptive Sync on and off so that you could see that it was actually functioning. So they do have a chart here with 1080p gaming. So remember these are in Ultrabook, so 15 or 25 watt CPUs. And what we're seeing here is Counter-Strike Global Offensive, which is the game they showed off, getting pretty high frame rates at medium settings, which would almost be expected of that. But showing games like Rainbow Six Siege and Dirt Rally coming in somewhere up 45 FPS, World of Tanks, Rainbow Six Siege, and Fortnite breaking over that 30 FPS barrier, which were completely unplayable on the UHD uh, 620. Now Rocket League and Counter-Strike were, but you see there's a pretty substantial bump there with Rocket League creeping ever so closely to that 60 FPS mark at 1080p, which is probably the native resolution on most of the laptops that these parts will be installed on. So now that we took a look at roundabout performance, let's take a look at just how it performs in the real world. So this was a white box laptop with it running in a 25 watt mode. So we'll jump into that and let you see that play out. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Nailed it. I'm, I'm pretty sure that was you, right? AK-47? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's something. Oh, 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 it's happening. It's happening. <laughs> 
it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. okay, you got your gun back, so maybe you could go and fight them there. Yeah, because I guess the bomb will explode soon, and then it'll be too late. All right, there's an op. Nice, nice. Yeah, so as we come bring it back, we're going to kind of wrap it up, and maybe we'll have a video in here of Gordon Ong from over at PC World playing Counter Strike Global Offensive, which was pretty entertaining. But they are focusing pretty heavy on the software side of things, and we did take a look at that a bit back and found it to be pretty promising. And they'll be giving users skins if they're into that sort of thing, and going even further with their one-click optimization which now supports 44 games and is continually growing and this is useful for people who aren't quite too savvy with uh, you know going in there and adjusting settings and knowing what they're doing but I'm gonna say that more granular control is needed for it to be really useful to most people so I'd like to see that kind of expand further but so far, the Iris Pro graphics in the 10th Gen Core series processors is looking pretty promising, and it's really good to see Intel take a good step in improving that portion of the piece of the puzzle, I guess you could say. See, the idea here is now you really don't have to worry about getting something else in there like an LMX 150 or I don't think there's really many other options in that for a low-powered light system without having to go to a dedicated graphics card so really good to see them innovate there and bring that into focus and it'll be interesting to see how they handle things and that may be a little bit of an indicator of how they handle their dedicated graphics line so with that all out of the way this has been keith with wccf tech tv make sure you're subscribed and hit that notification bell so that we don't miss you and the next one